Welcome to Brandstorm, the podcast that talks to the people behind America's brands. I'm Dan Trzinski, president of Platypus Advertising and Design. And I'm Nancy Christopher, PR director at Platypus. How can you get noticed when your brand is in a crowded space and you're just a small fish in a really big pond? Our guest today says you can play that to your advantage. Please welcome Prentice Howe, owner and CEO of Door Number 3, an Austin ad agency and author of the Empowered Challenger Playbook. Nice to have you with us, Prentice. Hey, Prentice. Hi, Dan. Hi, Nancy. Thanks for having me on. Your bio says that you're a true believer in the underdog. I actually am too, but why are you a believer? Oh, I think it, it probably taps right into human psychology, right? A lot of us just kind of love that and gravitate to that. I mean, you see it in sports. That's an easy thing to point to, right? right. And there's been all kinds of studies about it too, which I think it kind of substantiates it. But I mean, there was one I'll reference because it, it was top of mind right when you said that is it was like in the psychology bulletin years ago. But basically researchers, they asked about 70 participants to imagine that two teams, one's ranked higher than the other, were going to compete in a swimming event, like an Olympic swimming event. In, in each case, in each pairing, the participants said they'd always prefer to see the lower ranked team really prevail, you know, kind of win over the higher ranked one. Yeah, it just makes it more exciting. I think. Right. It's easy to hate the Patriots, right? <laughs> it, well, yeah, you know, and so it's, and I know it's not just sports, but it's just, it's in us. And for me, it's always been in me. We also see it in the products we buy and the brands that we gravitate towards. I mean, I think Customers of challenger brands are agents of change themselves. So they gravitate towards those that are kind of bringing good into the world, whether that's, you know, through innovation or better business practice or whatever it is. So that's at the core kind of what I'm all about and what I love and what we focus on. Do you think you have to foster that feeling of cheering for the underdog when it comes to product or a brand versus a sports team? I get the sports team analogy, but, you know, how does that create uh, laundry soap? Yeah, but look yeah. at McDonald's. I mean, they're always a target. For yeah, everybody, yeah. I feel sorry for. But them I still sometimes. like McDonald's, and I don't I necessarily, do you know, sure. I'm not a Burger King guy. Sure. I mean, there's a place for those brands, and they have the momentum. But I just think if you look at the ones that are winning in today's marketplace, and it's just an exciting time to see they've they've figured out a way to absolutely differentiate, and then every time they communicate, they they fascinate. And they are extremely consistent. They hit the same drumbeat. Um, and that's what builds advocacy. But it, it's tapping into something, some kind of alignment between what they're offering and the customer that is really powerful. So what are some of the ways the empowered challenger can help your brand, help elevate it? I'll describe it like this. I think there's kind of a difference between being just a challenger mm -hmm. and, and being one that's empowered. It's not just about the drive. It's about having the tools and the plan. You kind of need to have the roadmap to get there. So that's kind of what, what we talk about here. But that's just really goes back to uncovering and expressing and then just really amplifying that unique brand personality that makes you tick and then leveraging it for success. So I think anyone can be a challenger. It takes a really special company to be an empowered challenger and one that has the roadmap to get there. And that's really the difference. So you've listed five personality traits of an empowered challenger. Run those down for us. Well, look, David had five stones to defeat Goliath. Right, right. I think <laughs> brands have five personality traits that are really accessible to them at any time. So these personalities inspire the voice and tone of, of all the brand archetypes that we create on behalf of our clients because they're personalities that win. So I won't go too deep, but I'll, I'll, I'll get through all five. One, one is lightning rod. So it's really being that brand that is super authentic and polarizing and maybe turns some people off at times, but they're tapped into what's going on in culture and just being a bit of that lightning rod. And I think they do it in a way that pushes the conversation forward and pushes their brand story forward, not just for the sake of being polarizing. But there's a lot of examples of this. I mean, yesterday I was uh, I ended up back on Bird Dogs website. I don't know if you know Bird Dogs, but they're an apparel company. They do men's like leisure shorts for active wear. 100% lightning rod. I mean, read their copy, the way they talk. It's just over the top, but they know exactly who they're marketing to and they know exactly it's going to work for that specific audience. So they don't try to speak to other people. They're speaking to just one audience. That's lightning rod. Another one I talk about is heretical. So if you think of brands that are able to kind of look over the horizon, discover what people will need in the future and really just bring it to them ahead of schedule. Of course, you can look at an Amazon or something like that. I mean, who knew we, we would need drones delivering our packages? But, you know, Warby Parker. <laughs> Do we Parker, really need that, though? <laughs> well, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how that works out. But I mean, if you go to like Warby Parker, I mean, that's the way they disrupted. And is it, you think, cause is it really possible to order glasses online? Well, sure enough, it is. Their fans love them for that because they brought something to, to them they didn't even realize was possible. So heretical is kind of a personality trait of a, an empowered challenger. Another one is one of my favorites is what I call fostering rejection. So <laughs> it, it's, it's a personality 
trait that's about pleasing a select few. So having the cojones to kind of push the masses away in order to attract your most ardent fans. So you might do that by pricing people out of contention to get rid of some. You might do that in a myriad of ways, but it's really about finding a very specific cult-like following around one singular passion point. So that's a neat one. Another one is compulsive servitude. So that's about over-delivering. And I think over-delivering to the extent that it's the very definition of your brand. So, I mean, FedEx changed the way we ship things, yet need it absolutely overnight. You know, Ritz Carlton back in the day, they, you know, they changed things by knowing exactly what you would like to have in your room before you even requested it. I think please and thank you are table stakes now, but if you have, you see brands in the marketplace that are affecting the customer journey in a way that is just over delivering and delighting. Yeah, Nordstrom's comes to mind, you know, that kind it of, did, you know, yeah. yeah. No, I, and that's a great one. It's a great example. Zappos has sure, done that too. Sure. And, and I think that has become a calling card for some brands. So, and then, then the next one is in the last of five is constant evolution is what I call it. But basically these challenger brands that are able to transcend product categories. So if you think about a, a brand like uh, Shinola, which makes these uh, beautiful watches, American made in Detroit, it's all about craftsmanship. They're known for doing that, but somewhere along the way, they started making bikes and then they rolled out journals and then pet products and then turntables and then they opened a hotel and you kind of go, man, I'd love to see this business plan. But (laughs) what it is, is they've done so well in their origin category, they've earned the right to transcend and move into other categories because they're trusted for something very specific. So constant evolution is the fifth one. And so if we kind of look through the lens of these five personalities, we're able to create work for brands that we work for and and make sure that we're taking these into account and tapping into them at the right time, the right place. Can you really change who you are and how can uh, you apply these traits to a brand? Well, I think you can. I think you have to first kind of look in the mirror and be honest and say, what do we have? And do we have the product service offering, whatever it is that really say is, is going to challenge conventions and, you know, steal market share from category leaders. So I think you, at the core, you have to have the right product. But with that, I think in an instant, by taking the first step, you can start to operate with a challenger ethos. And I think that that's really what it's all about. All about. And so it starts with strategy, though. I mean, really yeah. just saying, OK, what do we and, and you all know this, but sure. I mean, it's what do we offer that they don't that customers want and need right. and how are we going right. to express it? with some amount of magnetism and not do it the same way because we can't spend the same way. So we just got to zig when they're zagging. And so it's absolutely doable. I think it's a commitment though to operating with that challenger spirit, not necessarily just with the way you market, but maybe with the way you have your culture internally, the way you operate as a company. So I think the word you used it a little bit a little bit ago is, you know, authentic. None of these traits are going to work if you're not really that. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, to your core, you have to be that in order to claim that. Right. You know, otherwise it's just, you know, we always talk about the brand being a promise of an experience and, you know, promise is a key word there. And, You're, you right. know, and if, if you can't live up to that promise, if you can't live that personality trait day after day in every form of communication, well, then it's just hollow and it's not going to work. No, you're you're right about that, and and I think what is that? What is authentic to you? And and I, not that everyone has to be a lightning rod or be polarizing. Right. I mean, there are brands that do that well. I think about like a company here in town called Everly Well. I think they're on Shark Tank, but basically they they provide at home lab testing with transparent pricing. So they're they're totally shifting paradigms. So authentic there is busting up perceptions about how lab testing needs to be done and being really honest about pricing and how this works. And it's just authenticity to them is very different for authenticity to, you know, bird dogs or hymns or some other company like that. But you just got to find it. Well, how about you? Can you give us an example of how you've used this same strategy to help your clients? Yeah. You know, we usually do that starts with strategy and then it's it's fun when we get to the implementation part. But I can think of a, a client that we've worked with for years early on, um, even when they were getting started. And that's Main Root Sodas. You, you may have had their, their root beer, or their blueberry soda, ginger beer. But basically, they're an awesome company. Fair trade, pure cane sugar. They're up against Pepsi and Coke. Sure. And we position them with the line rooted in goodness. Rooted in goodness allowed us to like have a platform for 
all the good that they bring into the world and um, really shine light on all the good that they do. The big soda won't and can't. And we've executed a lot around that strategy to allow the company and, and Mark, the founder, really differentiate and have something to say when he goes to the next grocery chain or the next, next restaurant chain that is considering bringing them on. But I think of one example, he left me a voicemail a while ago. He's just, a, he's a great guy. He's a character. He's very open and honest. And he was just ranting about the business practices of some of the big soda players. And um, he left this just hilarious voicemail and just listening to him talk cracked me up. And so what we, what we actually did is we took the voicemail and use that audio track to make a social video and then built graphics around that. But he's just going on and on about how they're different and man, people need to rise up. And and it was just perfect for laddering back to rooted in goodness as a as a campaign strategy. So we'll do things like that that yeah, um, that's great. you know, kind of poke the bear a little bit because you know, you need to, you have to, you got to, you got to stand up a little bit and say, this is how we're different. And it's not just in the product, it's in the business practices, it's in everything. And all of that is meaningful nowadays. So, so tactically talk a little bit about that. You've got to challenge your brand. You know, you're the small soda company against the big giants. You obviously don't have budget like the big giants do to get that messaging out. So are there specific tactics that you think challenger brands should be exploring? Is it more digital? Is it more guerrilla grassroots? How do you get that brand personality out there. Yeah, no, I mean, you can't overspend like they can. You can't even spend the same amount. But I think what it is, is it's not necessarily one channel. Outdoor could be wonderful. Digital is often wonderful. Social is great. Having brand ambassadors that are going to pick up the megaphone and and speak for you is great. I think the, the trick isn't so much the exact channel is finding your place, making sure it's different, and then being entirely committed to it. You just don't have the opportunity to try a lot of things and see what works. I mean, you can do that a bit in digital for sure. Sure. But I think the difference is these brands just, they double down and and they go for it. And it's, like you said, poking the bear too. I mean, it's standing out and being a little different. Sure. Yeah. Maybe that's a PR thing. Well, yeah. I mean, there's nothing more dangerous than spending money on a really bland message. I mean, we all know that, but but, um, that's, that's worse than even bad press sometimes. So Tell us a little bit more about your book. Who should read it? What's in it? What am I going to learn? The empowered without, 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 challenger. Without reading the whole book to us. <laughs> Chapter one. Um, <laughs> no, I won't do that to you. That'd be terrible. No, it's up on Amazon if, if anyone wants to find it. But really, I wrote it because the idea was to put something useful out that I think of whether you are a founder of a company, you're a CEO of a company, you're a CMO, you're a director of marketing, or have any role, any capacity in being responsible for marketing for a brand of this kind. At the heart, it's a positioning book, making sure that you're taking a close look at how you're positioning your brand. And then I get into the personalities that we kind of went, went over briefly. And then there's there's case studies. You know, I did interviews with brands that embody each of those personalities. So there's that. And then I think at the end of each chapter, there's like a, you know, challenge yourself, a takeaway of how you might be able to apply some of these learnings to what you're currently working on. Well, that sounds great. And you say it's available on Amazon, anyplace else? It's also at Book People in downtown Austin, if you happen to be in Austin. I'd love to go to Austin. <laughs> <laughs> so, Brennis, what's the best way to connect with you? Yeah, uh, dn3austin.com is our website. I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Prentice Howe, Instagram, same thing. So, a couple places on the internet for sure. All right. Well, thanks for being our guest today. It was fun having you on. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Good luck to you, and uh, I'm looking forward to reading the book. Okay. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Dan. All right. Thank you. And if you have any questions for Dan and me, please feel free to contact us on our LinkedIn pages. Thanks for your support. And if you like what you've heard, please don't forget to share, review, and subscribe to Brandstorm. This is Dan Trzinski, along with Nancy Christopher at Platypus Advertising and Design, an awesome company that creates perceptions that influence choice. We hope you'll join us next week for another episode of Brandstorm. Brandstorm.